Hello, uh, fellow advocates. You know, I've been wanting to speak to you about something for the last two years, and it's about a more engaged level of advocacy that I've been involved with. And it's about me not being a bystander in the fight to protect children. And now that COVID is behind us, I can finally tell you about it. But before we get to that, for some of you who don't uh, know me or don't know what my background is, I've been doing public anti-circumcision advocacy for the last 10 years. On behalf of Intaction, the organi organization I founded, uh, we've done a wide range of advocacy from protests of the Clinton Foundation for their support of African circumcision campaigns uh, to protest of Dr. Susan Blank from the AAP. Uh, but we've done boots at baby shows, we've done health fairs, we've been at Comic Con, uh, we've even done rock concerts. And uh, our, mobile our mobile education unit has been almost a fixture in Union Square in New York City for at least the last eight years. And I've done over 50 media interviews on TV. Now that I heard someone did 4,000 and 342, maybe, that does, maybe I got some catching up to do, but uh, I bet maybe uh, some of you here have done similar things. So okay, so let's get, get a show of hands. How many people here have done public advocacy? All right, excellent, awesome. Okay, so how many of you have heard comments like this? What's this about? Or, I support you, keep going. You don't need to speak to me, I kept my son intact. Or, I wanted to keep my son intact, but my spouse, partner, or family, they insisted that I do it. But, I support you. My husband's the one with the penis, I let him decide. When my son was born, I didn't know what to do. Uh, they said I should do it, so I let him do it but if I only knew better. Or maybe you heard a man say, too late for me, but I support you. Or maybe if you wanted to debate you on how circumcision prevents HIV or STDs or hygiene or the WHO or some third person account of how their uncle needed a circumcision later in life for, for some reasons unknown, as if their uncle was discussing with their niece their penis. But I think many of you have heard some of these, if not all of them. And then you probably had to deal with this. Brandolini was a great Italian. And for people that give arguments favoring circumcision, Brandolini's law starts kicking in. Also known as the bullshit asymmetry principle. I don't know if you can say bullshit in a symposium, but I just did it. The amount of energy needed to refute Bullshit is an order of magnitude greater that is needed to produce it. <laughs> so, of the people that offered supporting circumcision comments, and at our foreskin positive themed events, we get a lot of those, but how many people have told you this? I'm gonna contact my legislator and ask for greater protection for children. Who of those people that I previously described are really going to seek change? Probably no one. I know that. Because in all of my years' experience as an advocate, I never heard anyone say that to me. And what about all these celebrities making anti-circumcision comments? Joe Rogan, Russell Crowe, Howard Stern, Mario Lopez. What are they going to do for us? Nothing. They're just talkers. So after some years of doing this, I began to realize that educational advocacy has its limitations. Educational advocacy and public relations are still very important, but realize the limitations. Even if people support us and they don't believe in circumcision for children, they're not compelled enough to do anything about it. The anti-circumcision movement is a unique cause and it has challenges that other cultural or social causes don't have. How do you create change 
when the public, which may passively disagree with circ the circumcision status quo, they're apathetic to the issue because it doesn't directly affect them, and the victims don't seem like victims. It's a hidden issue. Babies can't complain. Most parents think they made a good decision, and they don't want to revisit that decision unless there's a botch. And even if there's a botch, they don't want to become activists. They're looking for an insurance settlement. And, and I know this because I've spoken to uh, a mother of a son who was seriously botched on Long Island with a Mojan clamp, and she didn't want to talk to us. She wanted us to respect their family privacy. So most cut men won't complain either. For them, what's the point? It probably took decades after the fact before they figured out what was even done to them. And they can't change their body. You can't put toothpaste back in the tube or foreskin back on the penis, more or less. And cut men may feel embarrassed to talk about this issue because it may bring their masculinity into question. So because of these factors and others, we're all stuck in this morass, unable to gain any traction. Therefore, it's up to us, those who really care about reducing circumcision rates to make change happen and to lead the way. Nobody, stand, uh, nobody understands the issues better than us, and therefore no one else is as motivated. Healthcare is a highly regulated issue, uh, industry, and a multitude of laws and regulations define the landscape on how things are gonna be. The publicly basically selects from predefined choices that are presented to them. We all hear about parental choice, but nobody asks parents about what they think about new health care legislation before it's passed. We have a representational republic. Our elected legislative representatives basically make the decisions for us. This makes influencing legislation a critical element for those seeking change. This is called lobbying. So what is lobbying? My best definition, it's freaking expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's not out of the reach of an established organization at the state level. The broad definition is to seek to influence a politician or public official on an issue. A lobbyist is a person or organization retained, employed, or designated by any client to engage in lobbying. We need lobbyists because they provide access to government legislatures that no single individual could possibly hope to achieve. Professional lobbyists have relationships with and access to elected representatives. With the ever-growing number of tasks and matters required of a legislature, issue groups need lobbyists to bring their issue front and center. Otherwise, your issue can fall into the uh, out of mind, out of, out of sight, out of mind category. And a lobbyist can be your squeaky wheel to get your issue attention. Also, lawmakers rely on lobbyists uh, as experts on their client's topic to provide information on complex issues. Legislators, especially at the state level, have little time or resources to conduct research. Now, some people may ask, is lobbying ethical? There's nothing inherently wrong with lobbying. Lobbying encourages people to take an active role in their government and is protected by the First Amendment as your right to petition the government. Most engaged nonprofits and advocacy groups employ lobbyists. Uh, for instance, like the ACLU, but even city governments will lobby the state capital. Uh, school districts lobby the state capital, unions, and unions use lobbyists. Incidentally, uh, hospitals, doctor groups, and health insurance companies also employ lobbyists to protect their interests. A special interest group like us is severely handicapped without legislative representation. So what's the difference between advocacy and lobbying? Basically, advocacy is when you have an opinion and you want to share it with someone else to change their mind. So you may tell that to someone when you're trying to get them to change what they're making for dinner. But uh, lobbying is a communication with someone who makes laws asking to make a change to a piece of legislation. So lobbying is a subset of advocacy.
I formed the Health Quality Campaign to lobby for all legislative priorities in New York State. We are a registered 501c4 nonprofit organization and financially separate from Intaction, which is a 501c3 per IRS rules. I hired a lobbyist from one of the largest firms in New York to represent us in the New York State Capitol. All health care law for the state comes out of Albany. Our lobbyist sets meetings for us to talk with legislators and their staffers to discuss our issues. And so initially due to COVID, we had to rely on Zoom meetings, but now it's, we're getting to more in-person meetings. This is our annual legislative guide. Uh, it's printed for legislators and their staff. It's a 15-page booklet that pitches our proposals. I think it's pretty good for a, for a small advocacy group. I set four priorities for us to focus on, which are to defund insurance payments for uh, for circumcision, require enhanced informed consent along the lines of what Matt Goodwin was speaking to earlier, uh, ban the Mojin clamp, it's a dangerous device that has a track record of disfigurement, and the creation of a New York State Circumcision Victims Compensation Fund. And I thought I kind of threw that in there as kind of like a uh, long range bomb, but actually that got more interest than the rest of them, which surprised me. Uh, as I mentioned before, healthcare is highly regulated. And if we make a good case, I believe nothing here is impossible. It will be challenging, but I don't believe anything is impossible. And our lobbyist acts as our navigator and our strategist. We hope to int introduce this sample legislation in the next session, the Children's Healthcare Transparency Act. It contains a lot of the points that Matt spoke about earlier, but first of all, it mandates written and signed, and signed informed consent that fully explains the risks and non-treatment options. It prohibits solicitation and suggesting as non-medical benefits as a reason for circumcision or using undue influence on a parent. It requires the agreement and consent of two parents if two parents are involved. It requires record keeping. It explains in detail all of the physical risks of circumcision plus issues of individual autonomy. It describes circumcision as an unnecessary cosmetic procedure. Does that sound too wild? Well, hey, as, as we say in our booklet here, there's one hospital in Queens that's already doing it. They say the benefits of circumcision, they're cosmetic. So if this hospital in Queens can do it, why can't all the hospitals in New York do it? And uh, providing a consent form does not mean that circumcision is recommended. Parents may freely choose not to circumcise their son by not signing the form or returning it. And of course, the consent needs to be in a multilingual format. So in New York State, we have Lobby Day. I don't know how they necessarily do it in other states, but they may have similar things. In New York, it's typically held in the first half of the year, depending on the calendar for major issues like getting the budget passed. Uh, you have to realize probably most state legislatures, like New York, they're part-time legislatures where they're only in, in uh, session for a few months a year or maybe half a year. But at Lobby Day, it's a traditional time when members of special interest groups make the trip to Albany to meet with legislators to have their issues heard. Now, prior to this, um, due to COVID, as I mentioned, we had a number of Zoom meetings with staffers to get our discussions kind of started as the state capitol building was closed, which is convenient, but it's really not as effective as face-to-face. -face. So our lobbyist sets up and coordinates the meetings for us. What he told me is the single most effective thing we can do is to go up to Albany on Lobby Day and meet with these people face to face. Single most effective thing we can do. So after some uncertainty and delays due to COVID, uh, on May 3rd of 22, the Health Quality Campaign finally had our Intactivist Lobby Day. We had seven appointments scheduled on that day. 
So uh, to have an effective meeting, it requires some planning. And first, our lobbyist sets meetings with legislators likely to be interested in our issues. So that would mean uh, members of both the Assembly and Senate that sit on the Health Committee. Obviously, that's, that's a high priority for us. Uh, also, uh, legislators that are involved with uh, children's committees and families, that's a priority. Uh, so, so he sets that up. And then I assembled a team, a team of activists for the meeting. And the more people, the better, but around 10 is pretty good. And when we get to the meeting, what we want to do is describe the problems in very concise terms. Uh, legislators are fixers, so they're attuned to finding solutions. Uh, I also like to describe the harm, but in specific terms, like a parent's regret, which is preventable. Uh, we talk about circumcision harm and the negative impact it has on, such, on some men, and great timing as we had that New Yorker Gary Steingart article, which so succinctly puts it uh, into focus, and we brought that up. And we also talk about issues of autonomy, which can resonate. Uh, we also like to talk about reining in the financial incentives hospitals have on performing circumcisions. There was one legislator in New York, Colina Rivera, she said circumcision, uh, hospitals are corporations designed to make profits. Okay, so that's, that's a lady we want to talk to. Uh, if you can bring actual regret parents or other impacted people to the meeting, uh, that really helps put a face to the problem. Uh, and other points to have an effective meeting are have, to have reasonable, attainable asks and have concrete proposals and draft legislation. Legislators and their staff are very short on time. Uh, the other thing we want to do is manage expectations. I don't expect to change a legislator's mind overnight. Policy changes can take years. But an effective meeting means you've completed the ask, you've received the commitment, and you have a follow-up agreed to. If you hit those three things, then you're doing really well. So, our group met with Assembly Member Andrew Hevesy. He's chairman on the Committee of Children and Families. He's also a member of the Assembly Health Committee. That's him right there. Obviously someone we'd want to win over. He took an interest in our issues, and especially in the area of informed consent. Senator Cordell Clear, which is this lady right here. Uh, she's chairperson on the Committee of Women Issues, Women's Issues and sits on the Health Committee. Strong interest in birthing, maternity, and child health issues. After we met with her and presented the issue, she told us, I get it. I'm for you. Tell me what I can do to help. Right. Assemblymember Tapia, who's in the center here. She told us she's a proud Dominican mom with four intact sons. <laughs> she sponsored some previous patient consent legislation in the assembly and she's interested in working with us. Uh, Senator Jabari Brisport is chairman on the Committee of Children and Families. Is this gentleman right here. He has a strong interest in health care issues. After I described the problems of New Yorkers regarding, facing New Yorkers regarding circumcision, he immediately offered that he was circumcised and nobody asked him. And he would have preferred to be intact. We closed our meeting with me asking, will you be our champion? And he said, definitely. Politics are a two-way street, so David Grant and I helped out in support of uh, Senator Brisport's August 23rd primary race in coordination with his campaign committee just this past Tuesday. Uh, fortunately, Senator Brisport won his primary, which means he's assured of winning another term. It can mean a lot to them to offer some support and be there for a legislator when he needs support. And, you know, we're doing this on a small scale. But if an activist group can co coordinate efforts to back friendly candidates, it could be a helpful influence and it doesn't cost anything. 
getting back to our lobby day, uh, we had a great group in the state capitol. We started at 7 a.m. in New York City. We drove up to Albany, did all of, all of our meetings, and then got back home by 8 p.m. Everyone spoke well and had something to contribute to the discussion. In lobbying, we're reminded of the five Ps. Politely persistent people persuade politicians. <laughs> We want to build relationships with these policymakers. Now, having a lobbyist isn't a guaranteed way of getting your legislation passed, but it does give you access to the legislature to pitch your proposals. Without lobbying, policymakers won't have a clue about the very real issues pertaining to circumcision. They'll only hear from the hospital interests. And without access, we're not included in the discussion on any health care bill. And then we get frustrated because nobody hears us. So after the success of our lobby day, in some ways I felt this is something I should have started years ago, if I only knew more then. In hindsight, I realized that just explaining to and educating people on circumcision harm and the benefits of an intact body it's not enough to create the societal change we're looking for. So what we have to do is we have to give ourselves permission to be more effective. We have to give ourselves permission to think big. We have to give ourselves permission to do the things the other special interest groups and advocacy groups do so successfully. And we want the government to work for us, not against us. Don't be a bystander. Let's lobby. Thank you. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, a practical question. When you are lobbying, about how much time are you allotted, because these staff members are very busy, so about how much time are you in with each uh, legislative assistant? Yeah, good question. Our meeting was 30 minutes long for each, each legislator. Um, yeah, thank you for that presentation. I was wondering, what would you say is the biggest challenge facing you guys to lobbying? Well, I, obviously, it's a very expensive form of advocacy, so that, that's a big challenge. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, and then COVID was another challenge, but thankfully, again, that's behind us. So uh, we had, uh, we couldn't do much over the summer because New York State had a lot of turmoil in their redistrict, redistricting, and uh, all their districts got thrown out by the court and had to redo it, and we ended up having a primary in August, which is unusual, so we couldn't do much work with the legislators over the summer because they were looking to get reelected. So uh, now that that's behind us, uh, going into September, uh, we're gonna restart our meetings and start talking about some of the stuff that we started in the springtime. Uh, Tony, first, thank you for your leadership. Uh, did you perceive any, any patterns between uh, Republican members and Democratic members in terms of what was interesting to them and, and how they responded? You know, not specifically. We went to meetings that our lobbyists set up for us, so uh, he used his expertise in finding out, you know, knowing, make, creating meetings with people where we'd get some traction with. So I don't really know if there's a red-blue divide, but I would tend to think that the more radicals are uh, probably supportive of us, while the more conservatives may not, but that's just a generalization. There's always exceptions. Tony, um, I, it was surprising to see you uh, in a political ar uh, arena campaigning for someone, but I suppose that's because it was a 501c4. What's the, the relationship between contributing to, the, to a 501c4 or how do you fund a 501c4? Yeah, good question. The big difference between a C4 and a C3 is if someone makes a donation to a C3, that's tax deductible, and a C4 is not tax deductible. 
because C4 can be used for political purposes, and I guess the, the prevailing wisdom is we don't want to give people tax breaks on their political contribution. So that's kind of how it works. But uh, you, know, you can even do that without having an organization. An individual can campaign for a candidate. Uh, I've done that before, even with another senator. Uh, I was driving him around to do door knocking. He was in my car. And then I, I got to grab his ear about circumcision. So. <laughs> Um, he kind of asked the question already, but they gave the microphone to me, but um, I noticed you talked mostly with uh, Democrat uh, state senators. Did you talk with any Republicans? Not that I'm aware of, no. Not yet, anyhow. We're still kind of new in this process, and I would assume that our lobbyists wouldn't want us to necessarily shun one side or the other because you need all of the votes to get your stuff passed. But. Uh, the, the, the lobbyist is good in massaging those issues for us. Yeah, I mean, I heard there was one in New Hampshire, for example, a Republican state legislator was sympathetic to our cause. Yeah, I'm sure they're out there. And, you know, I'm not interested so much in what their political philosophy is. I just want to know who's, who, who we can connect with. That's what's the most important thing. I, I don't care about whether they're a leftist progressive or a far-right conservative. It doesn't matter to me. So who can get our job done? That's what's important to me. Um, as a um, as a lobbying group, do you need to have people within their districts in order to meet with them, or can you just meet with them as a group, even if you don't have someone in their district? It helps to have uh, people from the district in the meeting, and and uh, but sometimes I'll take anyone in New York. You know, uh, they didn't get too fussy over you know, like you know, where are you from and are you a constituent of mine? Because and I think most advocacy groups that go up there, they have a wide range of people with them. Tony, I'm thinking that one of the answers to the question might be just, you could tell me if I'm wrong, is that in New York you're more likely to find um, Latinos um, and they're going to more likely be Democrats, so that might be, and that's also a, probably a more receptive, would you, I don't know if you would agree, a receptive group of legislators to our issue because you've got, you know, people from the Dominican Republic and people from Puerto Rico who are familiar at least with intact bodies, intact male bodies. Yeah, you're exactly right. You have to realize right now, under the current uh, situation, uh, the Democrats have a supermajority in New York State. So that's pretty much the party you're working with. But uh, other states can be different mixes. OK, there is, I think, one more question separating you from lunch. So. <laughs> All right, so uh, thank you very much for the hard work you're doing. I, I would love to do what you're doing in North Carolina. Let me know what I need to do. Um, one of the questions I had, though, was you're using your, lobby your lobbyist to talk to the folks who are most likely to be receptive to the message. There are going to be folks on the other side or folks that you're not talking to that have legitimate concerns that could be addressed or, you know, we could be finding out the reason for their apprehension or resistance. Does it hurt the process at all not to hear voices outside of our own little uh, sphere of interest? I think that issue would come up, and that's a good question, I think that issue would come up uh, when you have legislation in, in progress and you're trying to get sponsors and you're trying to see who your opposition is. Uh, I think most of the opposition will come from the medical lobby. So, you know, what one chief of staff told me is that, you know, sometimes it's even better to speak to the medical lobbyist your lobbyist speaks to the medical lobbyist and see how you can massage out your differences before you present it to us. That, that helps facilitate the passage of a bill. So uh, once you have a bill in play, uh, then it's our lobbyist, that's, that's his job to kind of see where the opposition's coming from and to try to attenuate that. David, any oh, sign? Yeah, everybody hungry? Okay. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>